Thank you, Beery. Uh, I, I just have a question. Uh, one of the things that Beery mentioned is, uh, is that HP is hiring, and um, you know, we're hiring the foundation. I, I wanted to know how many of you out there, uh, how many of your companies are hiring for OpenStack positions right now? <laughs> so we're, we're doing our part for the unemployment situation, I think. <laughs> Uh, all right, so moving on, we have our, our next keynote is, uh, is brought to us by Rackspace, and um, Troy Toman is a senior director there with their, uh, the Open Cloud engineering team. Troy is, uh, is also an OpenStack board member, and I think he was going to, to, to mention he's been involved in, in a very wide variety of ways in OpenStack over the, um, over the time that it's been around. So uh, excited to have Troy. So Troy Toman. <laughs> well, good morning. Um, I feel really honored to have a chance to sit up in front of this room and, um, and really speak to a community that's done some pretty amazing things over the last two years. Um, I think we're showing that there really is a different way to do this and, and proving that the power of the community is, is truly you know, greater than the sum of its parts. Um, I feel a, a personal attachment to this, this whole story of how it's come together because uh, of the roles that, that Jonathan sort of mentioned. Um, two years ago when OpenStack was launched, I was toiling away on database automation software inside of Rackspace, um, but felt compelled about the message of OpenStack. I'd, I'd been at Sun and watched what Linux did to Solaris. Um, I had ran the search business at Inktomi and watched what Lucene in the open source space did for search infrastructure in terms of making it available, and immediately you know, thought we'd found the right path and this was a compelling direction to go. So I, I kind of wormed my way into the job of running the Ozone team at Rackspace. Um, and you, may, you guys may know that, that that group that's been contributing to, to so many of the projects that are here back in, in uh, January 2010, with the mission of sort of pulling it together and figuring out how to uh, take the uh, second largest public cloud and convert it over to OpenStack. And, um, since that time, I've gone from sort of being a newbie to OpenStack to uh, being an OpenStack contributor, an OpenStack user, an OpenStack operator, an OpenStack board member, and I guess now I get to add OpenStack keynote presenter to that credential. So I think it's a testament to how this community can work. If you want to get involved and you believe in the cause, you can do amazing things in a short period of time. And uh, I just thank you guys for giving me the opportunity to be part of that. And I want to talk a little bit about sort of that journey and, and where we are at Rackspace. Um, so a little history lesson. We'll start off with kind of how Rackspace got into OpenStack and some context, um, particularly from the engineering point of view, um, which may, may be new to some, some folks. Um, then I want to sort of talk a little bit more in detail about how we're using OpenStack. Um, we've talked a lot about products we've launched, but I want to kind of dive into a little bit of, of how we've done that and how we use and run OpenStack, um, and then finish that up with uh, the chance to kind of talk about what I think some of our challenges are in OpenStack in the future, and really a request of the community about how to think about some priorities for next year. So for us, OpenStack started from an inflection point uh, in our business. By 2009, you know, we had built our cloud files offering with inside software. We had put together other pieces of the cloud through acquisitions um, and really had, had, had great success. I mean, we, are, we sort of inarguably had the, the second largest public cloud sort of starting from scratch. Um, but at the same time, we were kind of facing a wall. We really felt like the software we had um, didn't have the legs to get us where we wanted to go the long, in the long road. And so we had a decision to make about where we wanted to go, uh, whether we wanted to continue to try to take the stuff that we had and, and kind of cobble it together, or if we wanted to start with a, a blank sheet of paper. And um, we made the decision, and, and you know, I think a credit to, to the leadership at Rackspace, they really gave the engineering team the, the opportunity to start with a blank sheet of paper and tell us that if we wanted to build the cloud right, what would you do? Um, and, and we really wanted to gravitate towards the, the, you know, some, some key concepts, which is, um, open source being the number one piece, 
um, that we really wanted to build it in the open, we wanted to do it in a community environment, and we wanted to do it in as a transparent of an environment as possible. Um, and then we also wanted to do some things around how we use cloud technologies and how we actually begin to dog food the very things we tell customers to try to do. Um, and, and, you know, I think we, we, we grabbed that. It was sort of a bold and an ambitious idea. And to be honest with you, I, I don't believe that we actually had any idea how big this would become so fast. But it, it's been, you know, quite satisfying. So, you know, I don't know how many, how many people in the room were in Austin for the very first summit. Do we have people here? There's a few hands. I can't claim to have been there. Um, Chuck, who raised his hand, got a cameo he wasn't expecting up here on the slide. Um, you know, there, I think there were 75 people there. Uh, I was talking to Jonathan the other day, and he actually mentioned that the first summit, it was actually before OpenStack was officially launched, they largely did it just to see if people were really interested, because they weren't sure if they were completely crazy, this idea of coming up with an OpenStack summit. So we started two years ago in this small room in Austin, you know, driven by NASA and Rackspace. Um, you know, and then fast forward, Boston. Um, you know, that's actually, I'm not sure if we got the dates right on that. But anyway, Boston was actually in October of uh, about a year ago again, the Diablo release. Um, you know, which at the time was sort of the first time I think we all began to feel like that the OpenStack platform was coming together and you could really start to touch it and use it and have some dependency on it. Um, you know, it was when Rackspace launched our alpha product for, for cloud servers based on OpenStack. Um, and I think critically, it's when Rackspace found, you know, made the commitment to create an independent foundation and truly get OpenStack out and, and on its own. Um, and so here we are a year later, and look how far we've come with Folsom. I mean, it's hard for me to believe that in, in some ways we thought Diablo was rock solid compared to where we've come in a year with the capabilities and the evolution of the various components that went into Folsom. I mean, we've seen the emergence of Quantum as a legitimate networking platform and really the basis for the future. We see Cinder. Um, evolved to sort of give volumes and storage its, its sort of its key place in the infrastructure. Um, and we've seen just the stability of the overall project go up, increased security, um, evolution of Keystone. Um, I mean, it's sort of blinding how much has happened um, in, in the last year. And for me, it was sort of illuminating in going through this talk to put this together because probably like many of you, I spend every day thinking about all the things that are still broken, that aren't working right, that aren't moving fast enough. But when you think about the progress from that room in Austin two years ago to now, um, it's actually pretty dramatic. And, and I hope you guys take a moment to feel how awesome that is too, because it's really this room that has created this phenomenal movement. So here's an interesting thing. I'm gonna do something that's kind of the opposite of what everybody else does. I'm gonna brag about the fact that our numbers from Rackspace are shrinking. <laughs> um, So in Essex, we were over 50% of the contributions to that release. Uh, we were about 30% in Folsom. Um, and this has nothing to do with Rackspace being uncommitted or slacking. Uh, this is about the community growing up, more people getting involved, other companies contributing, making this a real community effort. And so while we're happy to have jump-started this, this process, I'm even happier to see that more people are jumping on board and that we're really seeing a broader distribution of input in, into the product. Now, you know, part of this also was that we got a little distracted with this thing called a product launch, and we probably haven't been as community focused as we want to. Um, but, you know, in, in, in the spirit of sort of following what everybody else is doing, I will say we are staffing up, and our commitment to, uh, to continue to get engaged in the community and to redirect a lot of our efforts to more community outward uh, facing things is, is stronger than ever. But I hope that our percentage continues to go down as a sign of the overall health of the community. And, and so this is another thing that we're pretty proud of. Um, and then the last piece, just to kind of level set where we are, um, I know we've talked a lot about the foundation, but you know, this is something uh, any one of the guys on my team will tell you, we have been clamoring for the independent foundation for OpenStack as loud as anybody. And you know, for us to actually be in, the, you know, to, for me to have actually witnessed us signing, the, you know, Rackspace signing the agreement to license all of the Rackspace uh, pieces over to the independent foundation. 
um, to actually be on the board and be part of the process. Um, and look, you know, trying to figure out how to make an effective 24-member board is a process I think all of us are, are working through, and we know we've got some work to do. But it is incredibly exciting um, to sort of be at this chapter and, and to see that this has a long history that's outside of Rackspace. Um, and so you know, I, I just think our commitment to open source is stronger than ever. And I also think it's been validated. Um, this community is stronger than Rackspace could have been by itself. It's stronger than any one of us could have been by ourselves. And um, just looking at the growth of the number of people in this room and the number of hands that were raised the other day that were here for the first time, I think we've got a very bright future ahead of us and it's extremely compelling. So I'm going to shift gears for a minute and give you some insight about what we've been building or actually I guess what we've been deploying that you guys built and, and sort of how, how we're doing things. Um, so at the, uh, at the summit in San Francisco, we announced sort of our preview of several OpenStack-based technologies. And I'm happy to say that we followed through on, on all those commitments. So we are now running uh, or offering at least four products based on OpenStack from Rackspace. Uh, we sort of launched our flagship cloud servers based on OpenStack on August 1st. Um, obviously, we've been running Cloud Files, which was the, the basis for Swift, and continue to invest and evolve that product. Um, we've launched our Cloud Databases product, uh, which actually has Nova with OpenVZ as an underpinning and the Red Dwarf uh, sort of container stuff that goes on top of that um, as, as, a, as a clear basis there. And we've released the Rackspace Private Cloud Download, a, a code named Alamo, um, to, to make it available for people who want to download and deploy their own private clouds. So, I want to dive into a couple of these um, just to share some insights, maybe some learnings, and, and a little bit of our approach, um, because I don't know that we've done a really good job of talking about how we actually are users and operators of Rackspace. We, we have a tendency to, to spend time in the Design Summit talking about our contributions, but let's dive into the cloud servers piece a little bit. So for cloud servers, the, the, the sort of basic building block and our starting point um, is, is a pretty common uh, probably deployment model with a couple of nuances that, that I'll talk through. But we use Nova, um, obviously, as the compute manager. Um, we actually, I think, we're one of the first groups to probably deploy Quantum in production. We may be the only company that actually deployed Melange into production. Um, and uh, I guess I should have added Incubator PTL as a temporary title for me for a while. But, um, you know, we obviously saw that the right, the right long-term answer is to merge IP management into Quantum, and so we'll be following that path, but right now we're still sort of running both Quantum and Melange in production. We use Glance for image management backed by uh, our Cloud Files Swift-based offering um, there. And so we start there. Nova obviously has the ability to manage, you know, several hundred hypervisors, um, maybe even up into the, into the thousands. But one of the challenges you have when you run something at our scale is we really had to be targeting tens of thousands of nodes in a compute region to get the kind of cloud scalability that we wanted. And so um, some of you have probably seen, we're at the talk that Chris Behrens gave the other day, um, but we started, gosh, I think Sandy Walsh, who's sitting there, started with an initial concept called zones a very long time ago. We didn't get that quite right. We evolved into cells. Um, and we actually uh, have deployed the cells code that we've talked about in our production deployment. Um, and, it, and it will go into, I believe it will go into Trunk and Grizzly. Uh, we didn't want to direct, disrupt the rest of you in Folsom with that, that code, but we actually deploy multiple cells um, in all of our deployments. I think we have at least three cells in every deployment uh, region that we're in today with our, with our public cloud offering. And so um, that really kind of forms the basis of what we call a region. We take all these products together. We then deploy, uh, currently we have three regions in the Rackspace public cloud, so our services exist in, in an ORD region, DFW, uh, and London, um, and so that gives us sort of a worldwide footprint in terms of where you can go and how you interact with these. So they, they appear as a single endpoint with sort of multiple Nova cells and these other services that, that kind of sit in behind them. Um, so that's a, that's a real quick overview, and there's, there's not a lot of, I guess, magic in that. I mean, it really is a testament to sort of the, 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 the quality of the software that's there that we can do this. Um, but, you know, I mentioned in the beginning open source was part of our strategy. We also were committed to trying to do some other things in a, in a different way in terms of how we approach, approach this. And one of the things was we, we realized that while we were building the cloud um, and while we were you know, selling the cloud and telling the rest of the world that everything should be deployed on the cloud, 
our first generation cloud infrastructure was all deployed on physical hardware um, in terms of the control systems that ran the cloud. Um, and in fact, our, our earliest uh, deployment for, uh, I think, the alpha was in a similar fashion as we were building these things out. But we realized what we really wanted to do was leverage the cloud in, in our ability to operate the cloud. Um, and uh, so we, we, we call it cloud on cloud um, at Rackspace, and it really is kind of our own version of inception. Um, so our public cloud servers offering the, the Nova API nodes, the database, the Rabbit servers, all of the control systems that you know of that run those systems run on a private cloud built out of all the same systems. So our API nodes are actually OpenStack instances running on a private OpenStack piece when you're hitting those. Um, and this was kind of a shift for us. It was, it was difficult. I mean, some of our ops guys will tell you they weren't big fans of the idea because they knew how to do HA in physical gear. But it turns out HA didn't work quite the same way in, in the cloud. And we had to, in fact, go out and reach out to members of the community like the guys at Hestexo to help us figure out how to do this. But I'm happy to say I think we feel like we made the right decision um, because it's, it's done two things. It's given us a much more flexible infrastructure, but it's also taught us a lot about how the cloud needs to get better. Um, and, and learning how to operate in the cloud. And, and I do think, you know, much like we talk about dog fooding, this is one case where it's actually benefited us greatly um, in terms of the kinds of patches and changes we've been able to submit back to the community and some of the knowledge we'll be able to share with, with the rest of the organization. Um, we've actually taken this concept to something we call iNova, which is an internal Nova offering that is the basis now for a lot of the Rackspace services that we're delivering beyond just the cloud infrastructure. So we're starting to use this for all of our own QA environments. We'll be using it increasingly for production environments, but we really want this to evolve to the point where Rackspace is running on OpenStack, not just offering OpenStack. And so that's been a pretty exciting journey for us and one that we're, we're very pleased with. Um, so that's why I get to claim both user and operator because we, we are using it in both contexts. Another thing that we chose to do um, that usually causes eyebrows to get raised when I walk around and, and explain what we're up to um, is we chose to use a continuous delivery model for how we're building and deploying our cloud. Um, so we don't use Essex or Folsom or Milestone releases. We pull from trunk, uh, usually at least once a day, and run through a pipeline that validates that. Um, we have a QA environment, we have a pre-production staging environment, we have a series of automated tests that run through that system. And so we can actually have a new trunk-based deployment of our public cloud software ready in under an hour in our staging environment to go to production if we want to. Now that's when it works, I, I will tell you. We don't have one <laughs> every hour, and seemingly nobody really wants us to deploy every hour um, but we've been deploying pretty regularly about every week or two since we launched the product. And I can actually tell you that right now, if you're using Rackspace cloud servers, um, you're running off of trunk as of October 10th. So we're, uh, we've already got Grizzly. Now you might ask why we would do something crazy like this. Um, we had a lot of discussions early on and you know, it really came down to two things. Either you work off of a stable base and you upgrade infrequently, or you sort of do this thing to track very frequent changes up at the very beginning. And we opted for sort of this fail fast, fix fast mentality. Partly because, you know, if you look at what's going on in the cloud today, this is what some of the most advanced groups are using. And I'll be honest with you, when you're running tens of thousands of hosts and VMs in an environment, you cannot test what's going on in production. So we have decided, push to production frequently, push small changes, be able to fix them fast. And that's the, 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 the mode that we've decided to operate in. Um, there are still days where we wonder if we're not crazy. But overall, I think um, it's actually benefited us in terms of staying, because we, we had to make those changes anyway. Um, and it's a tough choice. I think Vish told me the other day there were 60 database migrations between Essex and Folsom. So you get a choice. You can take 60 at once, or you can take 60 in small chunks. But you still got to take 60. And um, this is an approach that's actually been working well for us. And I'll, I'll talk more about where we might go with this um, down the road. Um, so then the question is, OK, so really, how well is this working? Uh, you made some marketing announcements. You put your press release up. Sure, I can log on. Um, you know, Where are you guys? And um, so a couple of interesting stats I wanted to pull and just talk about success overall. So we realized on. Uh, on August 1st, 
One of the problems is we had to flip a product on that was going to have 45,000 customers day one, which is a little nerve-wracking um, if you haven't done that before. And so, you know, we did a lot of testing going into this. We realized that by August 1st, between our alpha, beta, various internal test environments and systems, that we had built over a million servers on Nova. Um, and so we actually had a lot of confidence that this thing was working um, because we had pounded on this to that degree. Um, and, uh, you know, that actually paid off well in terms of the service. So we launched this on October 1st, and since then, we have taken 120 million hits against the Cloud Servers API in two months. So this is getting used. We have thousands of customers that have built thousands of servers. Across the board, almost every single metric that we track, the OpenStack-based platform is as good or better than our first-gen platform that's been in production for years, which to me is a good product launch. The one I'll give you that, that goes with that is we've done 128, 120 million queries with 99.97% availability. Now, for us, availability is anything other than a 500 error. It's not just up or down time. And this includes scheduled maintenances. So all those every two-week deployments that we're doing had this kind of impact on our API, which far exceeds, quite honestly, my expectations, but I think is a huge tribute to what we're building here. So you can decide whether you think this is ready or not, but I think the numbers speak for themselves, at least for how we're doing this at Rackspace. So we've even gotten to the point now where we're starting to actively convert our customers over. So one of the things that's nice about how this whole system is set up is you uh, a select number of our customers, and this will be increasing over the next couple of weeks, you can go into our control panel and choose to create an image of your server. And there's going to be a new option that actually allows you to create a next-gen cloud server image. So you're going to be able to take a first-generation Rackspace cloud server, take a snapshot, and then turn right around and build that server in the next-gen cloud. Um, and we're going to start actively promoting this because we have absolutely no reservation that this is the way for our customers to go. And in fact, our customers are voting with their feet. If you watched our growth, so our growth as we launched this product has actually probably ticked up a little bit from where it was before, but our first-generation product has basically flatlined. All of our new customers, all of our growth, all the things going into our system are going to the next-gen platform. And so we couldn't be happier as an OpenStack operator or user right now with how this is working for us and, and, and how this has, has come about. So the other area that we've been spending time on is in the private cloud. Um, we have a lot of customers that do come to us and say, well, I want to run OpenStack. And obviously, there's lots of distribution choices um, that are out there. But we came up with uh, our own distribution called Alamo that you can go to the website and download. Um, our real focus was to try to get something that was as vanilla OpenStack as possible, just so that customers could easily get, get it, uh, used to what's sort of there and in trunk. So we've, we've not put a lot of stuff around the outside of it, but we've tried to make it simple to install, um, easy, to, you know, really the way of sort of giving you the benefit of some of the learnings that we've had in the public cloud about how this stuff gets put together um, and what's there. But it is really about enabling the reach of our cloud offerings to expand beyond just what's available for people that are in the public cloud. Um, because we do know a lot of people. I actually spoke to one of our public cloud customers. They have Essex deployed for their development environment, and they feel very comfortable knowing that they're doing development on Essex, and then they're pumping that stuff up to the public cloud to run their production workloads on. And so there's a lot of customers that want that ability to do some experimentation locally and sort of interaction. And so Alamo was, a com was an important part of that, that process for us. So that's out there as well. And it's actually also uh, you know, done everything that we wanted it to do. So if we kind of go back, you know, we have our three public cloud regions. Since we've launched the Alamo download, we've actually had downloads from 125 different countries and every continent. Yes, every continent. Jonathan, you can add Antarctica to your list. We had four downloads of, open, of Alamo in Antarctica. So we really are taking over the world. 25% um, of the Fortune 500 has downloaded it. Uh, we've had over 100 universities and research organizations that have gotten into it. It just goes to show that the, that the, open, the interest in OpenStack is real. Now, the other interesting thing is um, there is a certain public cloud provider um, who's not involved in OpenStack that gets a lot of discussion. They have a conference coming up where they're featuring a bunch of their reference users. I can tell you that 10% of their reference customers speaking at their, at their conference have downloaded this as well. <laughs> so somebody else is thinking they might want to open up their options. 
Um, now, we're not done yet. So obviously, we announced the products that were there, but we've got some new stuff coming. Um, and uh, you know, the first one of these that we've, we've talked a little bit about, it's actually in uh, what we call preview mode. So we have customers running it in production today. We'll be opening it up more broadly in the next few weeks, but will be our block storage offering. Um, so we're going to be launching block storage. It is Cinder-based, so we will be, we're using the Cinder-based implementation right out of the bat. Um, we'll have two levels of storage available, sort of a basic level and an SSD high performance level. Um, our early preview stuff is going extremely well. Um, we're starting to see some performance numbers and, and scale numbers out of this that are very exciting. So for those of you who've been working on the Cinder project, thank you. Um, we look forward to having this running at production scale very, very soon. Um, the other pieces that, we're gonna, that we are, are in preview mode with that we'll be making more broadly available is our cloud uh, networks. And so I mentioned already that we, we use quantum. Today we use quantum for our base infrastructure. When you spin up an instance, you get a public network connection and a connection to the Rackspace service net. Um, our cloud networks offering will actually allow you to create your own private networks and begin to link servers together across. You know, think of it as a private cloud-based VLAN. Um, and so our work with Quantum and, and with NYSERA on the back end to do software-defined networking will take its next evolutionary step. Um, again, our preview is going extremely well. And uh, you know, in the next few weeks, you're going to see this broaden in its availability. And we're really excited about what that does and how that sets the stage um, for some of the hybrid computing that we've, we've all been talking about. So stay tuned for that. And then I would say the other area that Rackspace is really investing in is trying to share the knowledge um, and, and our experience with this in a way that makes adoption of OpenStack easier for everybody. So beyond the download of Alamo, this week we announced uh, two Rackspace Cloud SDKs. Um, these are not just for the Rackspace Cloud. They're meant to be OpenStack driven and based. So we've been contributing work to the JClouds initiative um, and have sort of packaged that up into a very accessible Java SDK. Um, we've built some PHP for PHP developers to get access to the cloud. Um, we have more of these SDKs on tap. Um, we are, and, and we are trying to stick to the open source mantra here of really looking for existing open source projects and contributing and making sure they're staying current with the latest developments in our cloud and with the rest of OpenStack. Um, I think Everett Taves, uh, who's probably somewhere here in the room, is going to be talking more about leveraging these, uh, particularly with the Java stuff that he's doing in a session this afternoon. So um, I'd invite you to go see Everett's talk on that. Um, the other thing is we're, we're investing a lot in training. Um, we constantly get people asking us, how do you do this? Help me understand. Help me learn. Help me do things. And so we, we are continuing to offer more and more training for OpenStack capabilities. Um, we're trying to take the knowledge that we've gathered from our private cloud in engagements, from running our public cloud, and make that as accessible to everybody. Um, because I, we honestly do believe that OpenStack's about all boats float. If we can make OpenStack adopted everywhere, everybody who's participating in this ecosystem will benefit. And this is yet just another way. Um, so we're, you know, we're targeting it towards operators, we're targeting it towards architects, towards DevOps personnel, and really tailoring some of the knowledge that we have and trying to share that as widely and as broadly as, as we can in the marketplace. So I just want to close by, by talking a little bit about sort of the future and maybe some of the challenges that we have in front of us. Um, you know, Rackspace actually didn't get into OpenStack just to rebuild our cloud. It led us to open source, but it isn't what we wanted out of OpenStack. I'll be honest with you, it would have been much easier to build our cloud with a bunch of guys sitting in the back of the room doing it our way. These design summits have a lot of debate. There's a lot of time and review processes. There's a lot of overhead, quite honestly, operating in the community. But the benefit of that is to make it better, but also to make it bigger than we could have ever made it by ourselves. And we are absolutely committed to the vision of OpenStack. Um, and in fact, as I was putting this presentation together, one of our marketing guys was going through my script, and he was like, when you say we, do you mean open, we OpenStack, we the board, we Rackspace? What do you mean? And I'm like, exactly. Really, if you ask anybody in my engineering team, we see them all as one, and we really are committed to making this happen. So as I said before, we've probably been a little bit distracted from the community because launching that product and supporting 120 million queries takes a bit of focus, but you're really going to see us turn our attention back to the community. Um, you know, we're, we're, you know my engine, this is as much for my engineers as anybody. You guys are going to get more time to get involved in the community, more time to get out in front of the things that are going on, and we're going to be... Um, both staffing as well as just reorienting our priorities to get more involved with that. 
But I also think there's, there's some things that we need to think about as a community about who we want to be. We started off with OpenStack being the ubiquitous cloud operating system. Um, and people want to overuse this idea of Linux of the cloud, but I think there's a lesson there that I, that I want to come back to. But, you know, we did the easy part. The operating system of the cloud needs to have compute management storage and networking. But, you know, Chris Kemp brought up a slide the other day that said it also needs a whole bunch of other stuff to go around it. And I think we have to think about how we move from this base stuff of the obvious piece to all the other things that could be in the cloud. There's a middle ground, I think, somewhere between it's just servers, block, and networking, and any open source project in the cloud ought to be part of OpenStack. And we haven't defined that very well. Um, I think we can learn some lessons from Linux in this regard. And I think we need to have a, the idea of a core set of projects that are stable and very conservative. You know, the question comes up is if you've got something new that you're thinking about core, it's like, would you put that in the Linux kernel? Is it mature enough? Is it widely adopted enough? Now the challenge in that is we don't really have an alternative for things in the middle that are innovative. I mean, I'm looking at what's going on right now with Solometer, StackTech, Synapse, the metrics and monitoring stuff. I mean, that is absolutely essential that we figure that out. But I also don't think OpenStack's in a position to pick a winner that says, oh, we're gonna do this project and it's only this project and it's certified. So how do we think about this ecosystem where we've got a core that is solid, conservative, we know is the right thing, but are still enabling an innovation under the OpenStack umbrella as something that people are inspired to be part of. Now, I don't have an answer for that, but I've raised this at the board. We all know, working with the technical committee, we need to tackle it. But I think as a community, we need to raise our voices about how we want to do this. Because I think otherwise, this thing will get away from us in a way that may not be to everybody's benefit. Um, I think it all goes back to this notion of stability. Obviously, we feel like the releases we have are stable, but we do need to think about what stability means along in, on the road. And, and I, I think of it, the best analogy I could come up with is it's like a car. We want to go fast. We want to go flying down this curvy road, but we don't want to do it in a Yugo. So, I, you know, there's a reason these cars are engineered these way. There's a reason there's this attention to detail. And we need to figure out where this balance is. I personally think 60 migrations in six months might be a little much. I think we need to figure out how to stabilize. I think we need to think about how data migrations are done in a non-disruptive way. It takes a little bit more to add a column now and subtract a column in a later migration, but man, from an operator perspective, that's a lot better place to be than having to sit there and wait for an hour of downtime while data shifts from one column to another. I mean, there are things like that that we all know how to do that we just need to slow down and take the time to think about. And I don't know if now is exactly the right time to lock it down. I'm pretty sure it is for a year from now. And I think we need to start moving that direction. Um, and so I just raised that as sort of a caution and an area for us to kind of focus on. Now, we're gonna do some things from Rackspace to try to help with this. As I've mentioned, we've got this pipeline. We wanna push more of our tests up the stack. Um, we wanna get them higher and higher into the integration pipeline so that they're seen closer to review, <clears throat> closer to review time and not you know, when Rackspace pulls from trunk and we realize there's a problem. So we're gonna work on that. We wanna expand the reach of our own testing. It's nice that we've got this pipeline, but as most people will tell you, it is narrowly focused around the Rackspace public cloud use case. So we're not really seeing if things are breaking the KVM hypervisor, because we use Zen, um, for instance, or even our own Alamo private cloud stuff. So we're gonna be broadening our pipeline so that when we're going through these gates, we're starting to think more broadly than our narrow use case. Um, and the last piece is we wanna figure out a way to provide some visibility. I don't want to gate trunk based on our checkpoints, but I think the community would benefit from understanding when stuff downstream at Rackspace is broken because of something that comes through. And we, and we have to figure out how to do that, but that I'm absolutely committed to us opening that up and providing more visibility back to the community about the things we're seeing so that the community can begin to embrace this and, and it's not just sort of our challenge. So those are a few things we can do inside of Rackspace, but I hope as a community we'll rally around others. Um, the last thing is, I think it's time that we really shift our attention to, to delivering on this idea of the open cloud. Um, a lot of this year, um, and, and rightfully so, has been about proving that an OpenStack deployment will work. I mean, this is obviously what we've been doing, trying to get these clouds out there, trying to get them deployed. Um, everybody here is doing the same thing, right? We're having OpenStack clouds pop up all over the place, and that's an awesome thing. But what I constantly hear is, gee, the benefit of this is everybody's running OpenStack, it should all work together. Well, I think we've got a lot of gaps there, and this is the year to start figuring out how we're going to close them. 
Um, look, Rackspace is one of the worst offenders of this, so I will take my shots for that. Alamo and the public cloud don't work together any better than anybody else's OpenStack cloud works with anybody else's. So we are absolutely committing resources to get unified behind a code base and a direction and pieces inside the Rackspace realm that will make our private cloud software and public cloud software interoperate. But I don't want to stop there. We need to solve this as an OpenStack problem. We need to solve this as a community. Again, I think this is on the board and the technical committee as the leadership of the foundation to figure it out. And I don't have all the answers yet, but it is something that we're absolutely committed. I would absolutely ask all of you to, to rank as a high priority for this year. There's three things we're going to spend time on that we will obviously work across the community on as well. But continue to focus on API compatibility. Obviously, the SDKs help. Um, you know, we have base APIs that were all there, but I think we need to begin to think about how we talk about compatibility of Rackspace clouds. It needs to move, you know, we need to think about how extensions move into the API that everybody needs to support. I mean, there's, there's a whole process beyond this baseline that we need to work on. We're gonna do that for our offerings. We'd like to do that with everybody else's. Um, another big area for us to focus on is interchangeable images. You know, the good news is that our customer can run Essex and then push to the public cloud. The bad news is he can't just take the image that works on Essex and make it work in our public cloud. Now that's because we don't support a Glance API, so we've got to work on that. We also do things differently. We use Zen Server, we use Zen Store to auto configure. We don't use sort of whatever, you know, some people use metadata service. Um, we, are, we are going to converge on a single mechanism for instance creation and an interchange format between glances that will absolutely ensure that any glance can export to any other glance and that any base image can boot in anybody's cloud that supports it. Now we're leaning towards config drive as opposed to metadata service, but that's really a community discussion that we'll engage in because we want to go where the community wants to go. But we're going to make that investment um, in our public cloud to make this so that anybody's images on OpenStack can easily get into our cloud. Um, the last place, I think, is just the evolution of true cloud networking. Um, so getting quantum out is a start, but there's a lot more to do there. Um, you know, we, you know, even if you get quantum on both ends of the pipe, there are things around federation. So if I have a shared network L2 segment between two quantums and two public clouds, how do you decide that you allocate from IP address subnets and not conflict? I mean, these are low-level geeky things that we have to work through, but they're the difference between making this easy for people and not. And so these are three areas that we are actively committing resources internally to solve, and, and hopefully that's something that we can get the rest of you guys to rally around. Um, all right, so that's it. Um, you know, thanks for your attention. This has been an amazing journey, I think, for all of us. Um, and for me personally, there, there's, there's a lot to this. Um, I think a big thing that we all have to learn how to do is take the leap of faith and trust in the community. We probably all have those moments where we're a little bit afraid that if we if we put it out there, if we don't hold on to it, if we don't protect it a little bit, we're gonna lose control of it. I can tell you after two years of doing this, quite the opposite has happened. The only places that I've seen Rackspace make mistakes, um, some of these were mine and some of these were others, but where was we didn't trust the community. Um, I've learned to do that, my development team does that, we're gonna do more and more of that. If you're here for the first time, trust this community. We're all in it for the same reason. We may disagree on the means sometimes, but I think we're all motivated by the same ends. Um, and if we have two years that are even close to the two years we've had before this, um, we're going to have, you know, one heck of a thing to celebrate a couple years down the road. So I look forward to being there with all, with all of you for that. And uh, anyway, thanks and have a great morning.